Fields. I work for Palantir.net. We're a consulting firm based in Chicago. We do mostly but not ex exclusively Drupal work. We've also done some Silex work and some Symfony work. Uh, we work mostly but not exclusively with institutional nonprofits, universities, museums, public radio stations, hospitals, uh, some media companies as well. It's kind of our uh, standard. Uh, we're one of the sponsors. For more information, do stop by our booth. Uh, I'm going to be there in and out, so you can talk to us there as well. Enough commercial. So, uh, Silex. What is Silex? <coughs> uh, Silex is a micro framework built on these Symfony 2 components. What does that mean? It means it's an unopinionated Symfony, is the best way I've heard it described. It's you know, with Symfony, full stack, you get a fully built, full stack framework with a lot of functionality baked in, ready to go, uh, templating system, database system, uh, and so forth. Not as much as you get baked in with, with Drupal core, but you get a lot of functionality there, ready to go. And most importantly, an architecture implied. If you do, there is a Symfony way of doing things, TM, just like there's a Drupal way of doing things. There's not really one way of doing things in Silex. That's by design. Silex is uh, a micro framework, micro in the sense of it does not imply a given architectural style. This gives you the freedom to implement the architectural style that you want. It also gives you the responsibility to implement the architectural style you want and to do it well. <coughs> As I said, there's no one right way to do Silex. Uh, different people will have a different spin on it. What we're gonna go through here is essentially how to do Silex well, Larry style. So this is the Krill endorsed way of using Silex. It's not the only way, it's just the way that I find helps to keep a Silex application maintainable. So we're gonna go through a uh, fairly basic Silex application starting from scratch. <coughs> uh, if you wanna follow along, this is the source code, github.com slash palantirnet, all one word, 0-2 Silex. I'll also be tweeting the link later if you don't want to download it now. So let's just go ahead and dive in. We've got uh, there we go. Here's our code. So let's start, as any good PHP app does, with a composer file. And we pull in Silex. The entire system is a dependent third-party dependency of your code. Unlike, say, with Symfony, which you know, if you're using Symfony Standard Edition, it comes with a lot of stock code you're supposed to use. Every single line of code we have here is something I have written, not stock code that comes with some standard Silex toolkit. There are stock standard Silex toolkits. Uh, I don't use them. I prefer to just roll my own. This is my standard Silex toolkit. So we include Silex itself, and that gives us um, you know, various Symfony components that it's built on. So it uses the same HTTP foundation, HTTP kernel that Symfony uses, and Drupal 8, and Laravel, and uh, PHPBB and a bunch of others. Um, <coughs> uh, same routing system. So a lot of this will look vaguely familiar, at least conceptually. As far as our own code, let's go into our web doc root. And that's the entire application. We create a new instance of this Silex application object <coughs> and run it. And we're done. We now have a working application. And if we load that up in a browser, we get an error message. This is great, actually. This is a very good place to start because we're getting a proper formatted 404 message, which means routing happens. The routing system is already there and working for us. And error handling is, is there, so you don't have to think about 443s and 44s and so forth. That's already taken care of. <coughs> great. We now have a working application. Let's go home. Okay, now let's add features to it. So, let's uh, start some basic routing. After we create this application, we can add routes to it. <coughs> to add a route, there's a lot of methods you can just call directly on the application. Uh, in this case, we're going to create a get route, HTTP get, for the slash about page, which is going to respond with 
that controller. This is a controller just like anything else in Symfony. In this case, we're just specifying it as an inline anonymous function. It can be any callable. Callable meaning um, thing in PHP you can put parentheses after. Function name, uh, object and method, class and method, anonymous function, I think that's it. Uh, so we're just going to make it inline and return a new, a new instance of Symphony's response with some text message. And that response, actually, Drupal people, good question. Who was at my Drupal 8 talk earlier? Most of you, okay. This should look very familiar to that presentation, actually, because these are built on the same foundation. We're just returning a response object. <coughs> and that's the entirety of what we're adding. If we want to uh, respond to a put request, then we do app put instead. If we want to respond to a post, it's app post. And you can uh, specify respond with different controllers for each HTTP method. If you want to respond to all methods, which honestly I almost never do, then uh, you just say app match. So now, we go to slash about, and here's our response. This is a super simple messaging service. Questions at that point? Didn't think so. <laughs> it's not that much so far. Um, there may be an add-on to do that, but I haven't seen it. I haven't used it. So let's do something a slight bit more interesting. Um, so as in any good application, your business logic should not be in controllers. Your business logic should be in services. So let's add a service. <coughs> uh, the app object is actually uh, subclassing from Pimple. Pimple is the world's simplest dependency injection container that people actually use in practice. It's about 100 lines long, maybe 150 lines long, um, and works with PHP's array access methods and anonymous functions. It's actually really, really cool. Um, and it's what uh, everything in Silex is built off of. So we're going to create a parameter, just like in the Symfony container, you get parameters, same idea here, called rot encode count. I'm going to give it a value of 13. And then we're going to uh, register a new service called rot encode. That service is. This is the anonymous function, or the callable, can be any callable, that will instantiate this service when called. And we wrap it in an app share call, which means cache this and only instantiate it once. So right there, we've got everything we need to create this service. We just you know, close over the app itself and then return a new instance of this rot encode uh, class and pass as its first parameter that rot encode count um, parameter of the container that we just defined right here. What is this rot encode class? It is a very simple encoding system that uses uh, rot encoding. Who's used rot encoding before? It's a very basic uh, form of encryption. Uh, it's a two-way, or potentially two-way encryption, uh, where you just take every character and rotate it. So rot1 is A replaced with B, B replaced with C, C replaced with D. Rot2 is A replaced with C, D replaced with D, and so forth. Uh, which means rot13 is reversible. Rot13 is something to encode it. Rot13 is again to get back the original. This is also known as the absolute worst security system in the universe. It serves no purpose other than to be used in slide demos. <coughs> um, so this is just a simple class that has a, you know, takes one constructor parameter and has a rot method on it. It takes a string and does that encoding on it. Don't worry about that, actu that actual code. It doesn't matter. I actually pulled it off of uh, the php.net documentation as an example. Please never use this in production, OK? Promise me that. So uh, we're going to we register that service. That service is completely standalone, nothing to do with Silex itself, which means easy to unit test. That's what you want. 
and then we're going to modify our controller to rot encode that string instead. And it'll encode it with whatever we had configured it with. And we're just going to return a string rather than a response. What? One of the nice things with Silex, it automatically has a view listener registered. If you return a string from your controller, it will automatically get just wrapped up into a response. If you want to return something that's not a string or a response object, you write your own view listener. We'll see that in a little bit. So that we've got, that we've got that written. Let's have a look at that. And that is the rot encoded, the rot 13 encoded version of this string. Uh, footnote, rot 26. What does that actually do? Gets back your original string, which is technically still encryption under the DMCA, so reading something is a, vi is a violation of the DMCA. I always have to throw that one in there. So this is great. We're going to um, just hard code everything. Usually you don't want to do that. So. Add some services from someone else. In Silex, if you want to uh, package up a service, <coughs> you can pro write something called a provider. A provider is a class that says, hey Silex, here's a bunch of services. Enjoy them. And uh, Silex simps ships with a couple of providers, not the libraries for them. You have to download those separately. Uh, so in this case, we're adding Docker and Dval to our composer file. And then in our app, we're going to call app register that service provider that comes with Silex. Just a new instance of doctrine service provider and the parameters that we give that service provider. In this case, we're going to say we're creating a database with uh, SQLite. <coughs> um, here's the path to it. Great. And then in a controller or wherever else, we can access the database connection just out of the, the uh, container. And note, this does mean your, con your controllers here are uh, con or container aware, which is a bad thing, but controllers. And have whatever logic you're doing. Incidentally, we have this registered as a get method that's going to drop and recreate the database. Please do not actually do this in production. It's just a convenient place for me to show that, hey, yes, you can call doctrine. All right. So, so far we're up to about 60 lines of code in our index.php file. Who thinks this is going to scale well? Didn't think so. Generally speaking, putting a couple thousand lines of code into one giant index.php file is not a good idea. So what's the alternative? There's a couple of different ways that people solve this. The way that I recommend is just extend that application class yourself. So now we've got an application uh, class that extends the base synth Silex application. And then in our constructor, we're just going to move all of the code we just had into here. Nothing really exciting here, just moving code around. And I like to break it up into a couple of utility methods. You don't have to, but uh, I find it convenient. So we've got our custom services, third-party providers, and any, any routes we're going to create. No new code here. I just moved it into a class. And then our index.php is just create our new application. It's a subclass of, simp of uh, Silex and run it. And you can also flag debug mode true if you're going to leverage that. That's not a magic variable. It's just the name that I decided to give this property. Now, one issue here, this, there we go. We now have this path to our application database hard-coded. It's not a huge problem when I'm using SQLite. I'm using MySQL or Mongo or Postgres. Who thinks it's a good idea to hard-code your database credentials into your application class? Good. 
that's how, how do we provide configuration? Silex by default doesn't have a configuration system in it. It provides nothing out of the box. So let's go get one. The standard one that uh, is generally used is from Igor Leiter, I think is how, we, how his last name is pronounced. Uh, and it's a third party download, just pull it in with Composer. And then we register that service provider and give it a directory name. And it can handle its configuration files in JSON, YAML, PHP, and I think one or two other formats. Uh, I like to use JSON because these are going to be parsed on every page request. There's no automatic caching and container building going on here. So this is parsed on every page request. And JSON is a lot faster to parse at runtime on every single page request than YAML is. If you want to use YAML though, go ahead. <coughs> and I'm actually going to load it twice, we'll see why in a moment, with different parameters. In this case, I'm going to uh, specify a different file name environment.js. Let's hmm. so have a look at these config files. So that settings is just you know, a JSON file that has a path to our database, our, a name of our database. <coughs> uh, you can also put the uh, rot and code count in here. In this case, we're setting it to 26, which means transparent but still actually encryption and therefore illegal to read. And we can specify an environment. This is, is not a required way to set things up, but this mirrors the way that the typical Symfony app is set up. So your settings JSON file, you don't check in to get, because this has your database credentials. This has, are you in dev mode or production mode? Silex doesn't understand the difference. I'm building the difference in myself right here. Because that environment, everything here becomes available as a property on that dollar app variable, on that uh, app object. So. Now that, that first uh, first line there registers, uh, loads up that settings file, we now load up whatever our environment is. So we're in dev mode, so we load up dev JSON, which turns on debug. Load up prod JSON, turns on false. All of these will just be merged into that gigantic app object. <coughs> Don't want to set it up this way, don't set it up this way. This, I find, is very convenient to have everything uh, checked into Git that I need checked into Git and still support different uh, operating environments. <coughs> and if you want to have multiple config files uh, for different types of configuration, you absolutely can just call that uh, provider multiple times again. Okay, so we've got uh, a couple of third party providers, but we're still registering this service of ours ourselves, this rot in, rot in code service. Wouldn't it be cool if we could write our own providers instead? Anybody? Yes? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Fortunately, we can. It's actually quite easy to do. I'm going to a new ROP service provider class, which implements the service provider interface. This is a uh, Silex uh, interface, Silex provided interface, which has two methods on it, register and boot. Nice and simple. Register gets past the application and you call the exact same stuff on it that we just had in our application class a moment ago. Boot does exactly the same thing but gets called after all of the registers. This lets you vary what gets registered based on some other service provider. So it's really just a, a two-pass approach. <coughs> but exact same code. And then in the application, we just register our ROP service provider uh, provider. Now note the important thing here is the order because all of these uh, providers will get called in the order you specify them in the code. And if they conflict, whichever gets called last wins. That's how you can have overrides for, say, a different environment. It also means ROP service provider can, by default, have an encoding of 13, 
but configuration gets last loaded later, so if it specifies that route encoding count, that wins over uh, what the module provides by default, or what the provider provides by default. Which means just by keeping the order straight of our providers, we can have default configuration for some kind of bundle and overrides just by varying the order. It's a very, very simple approach. Okay. All right. What else would, could be clean up here? Well, we've still got all of these routes here. Could we get rid of those too? Can we move those out of the app class? Well, yes, we can. You also have controller providers. work in a very similar fashion. Uh, just have any arbitrary class, implements an interface, <coughs> and has a connect method on it, which gets past the application. And then I'm not entirely sure why, but you need to call, you need to get access to the controller's service, which is really just the Symfony routing component, and call get on that directly. Why the documentation always says to do this, and why you then need to return the controller's service itself, I have absolutely no idea perfectly honest, but this is what works. So again, all I'm doing here is moving code out of the base application class into this provider. <coughs> and I can then put these provider classes anywhere I want. There's no rule about it. So if I want to wrap up this rot encoding service as its own standalone PHP package, and then have a little bridge package for, uh, for Silex that it has the provider, then I just make those two separate composer packages, to, uh, require those in my composer JSON file. In my code, then I just, you know, uh, register that uh, provider, and poof, I've now got a completely freestanding PHP library wired in to Silex. That's it. And because there's nothing really going on here, there's no magic happening, it's very lightweight. It's just loading classes. That's really all that's going on. All right, let's try and do something actually interesting because saying hello is not the greatest application. So what shall we do for a demo? I should point out that at least in the United States, federal law requires that uh, if you're demoing a framework, your sample application is a blog, and if you're demoing a REST API, your sample application is Twitter. And I have no interest in uh, annoying the feds, so we're going to implement Twitter. Because what else are you gonna do? So what are we gonna need for a Twitter application? Well, we're going to need users and messages. So, I like to break out my application into kind of, modules is almost too heavy a term for the Drupal people, um, but essentially I'm going to create modules here, really just by putting them in separate namespaces. So I'm going to create a users directory namespace and create a user repository, which is just a wrapper around you doing a find, find by username on Doctrine. I'm not going to bother getting into the uh, actual code here. It's all pretty mundane CRUD stuff. <coughs> Users have uh, a username and an age. And note here, we get the uh, doctrine dbal connection object as a dependency, which is the only dependency we have is on doctrine dbal because it's a repository, so it kind of has to be. And uh, then we're going to register that with our own service provider, where we're just returning a new instance of the user repository with its first parameter being that doctrine. This gets you the same result as wiring things up in the Symfony dependency injection container, but it's one anonymous function callback rather than compiler passes and YAML files or maybe XML files or whatever it else it is you're gonna do. This is about as simple as you could possibly get. You had a question?
So the app share method, this is part of Pimple. Um, so let's actually just look at this, this example directly. So we've got AppDB. AppDB is a service registered this exact same way by the doctrine service provider. When we call AppDB, that uses PHP's uh, underscore underscore, excuse me, PHP's array access uh, methods. And it says, do I, have I instantiated AppDB yet? No, I haven't. All right, I've got an anonymous function registered for that. I will call that, and whatever comes back from it, be that an object, be that a string, be that a resource, be that whatever you feel like returning, is what I will then return. Wrapping an app share means second time it gets called, oh, I already did that, I'll just return the same one as last time. It's actually a little bit weird that you have to call app share around that because honestly, that's the typical use case. So actually pimple two, um, this is uh, Silex 1.2, which is using pimple one. Pimple two reverses that. So the default is to have uh, a shared uh, service. And there's another thing you wrap it in to make it not shared. Does that answer your question? All right. <coughs> so it's, it's just like in any other dependency ingestion container. This gets called the first time someone needs that service. And if that means it needs to instantiate some other service lazily at that point in time, it will do so. <coughs> And then we're also going to uh, set up some controllers. So we're going to have posts to slash users would be uh, this controller where we take the request object, get its content, JSON decode it because remember, this is a JSON based API, take that data, create a new user, and then redirect to the user we just created which is what you're supposed to do in HTTP when you create a new object. <coughs> is you send a 201 created response with the URL uh, that you should redirect to. So we use Symfony's URL generator, which is the same thing you're used to from Symfony and is also in Drupal 8, to generate a link to the users.view route with this as the parameter, the username that we just created. And then we call app redirect. But what's this? users.view route, we haven't created that yet. That's down here. So in this case, this is a get request to users bracket user, which is this controller <coughs> uh, in which we you know, grab the repository that we created a moment ago, run find by username on it, just look up the user, strip off the uh, internal ID because you shouldn't expose that in a REST API, and then return that as a JSON blob. This is just a utility wrapper around new JSON response and data. And then we're going to bind it to users.view. Every route in any Symfony-based system needs to have a name, needs to have a machine name. In Silex, if you do not specify one, it creates one magically for you behind the scenes, but you don't know what it is, so it's not useful to you. If you want to refer to a route, you have to give it a name by binding. So, but once we do that, then we can create a link to it and redirect to it. Cool. One slight problem with that. Remember I said nothing comes by default? Yeah. We need to register the URL generator service. You can't even generate URLs by default until you register that. Fortunately, that's baked in uh, and, and ships with Silex. So you just add that line and you're done. And then we're also going to register our user service provider. <coughs> and register routes. And for that, we call app mount, which lets us register those controller providers. And, uh, the first parameter is everything provided there should have this prefix on it. In this case, we're saying both things just come from the app root. You could also set it up so that everything is slash users and then whatever. Again, do it however you'd like. Symphony actually supports the same thing. Uh, Drupal people, we do not allow that for Drupal 8. <coughs> it just gets too weird when you're doing something in Drupal. Right? Now, one problem here. We said before that app class looks like it's getting 
or the uh, index PHP looks like it's getting really big and full of anonymous functions, and anonymous functions are really hard to test. Those route providers uh, look like they're getting really big, or controller providers look like they're getting really big and hard to test. Because we've got all of our controllers in anonymous callbacks, and you can't test anonymous callbacks. So what do we do about that? You can register controllers as services in Symfony and in Silex and in Drupal if you are so inclined, although we usually don't. So, I'm just going to add another um, method here. Go. Yep. Once again, we have to register another provider that gives that ability to the routing system. And then the controller provider, I'm going to, uh, instead of specifying an inline callable, I'm going to give it the name of a service and a method. This is the exact same syntax you can use in Symfony for service and method that will be a controller. And same thing here. And then our service provider, we have our user controller uh, class, which is our service, user.controller, user that's the name we gave it before. And we return that. That'll get instantiated. We call that uh, get method on it, uh, on that class. We look at that. We're just taking the same code and moving it into actual methods, which is where act real code belongs. Now, one thing to note, I am using, I am actually passing the application object into the constructor here, which means I do have container-aware services, or excuse me, container-aware controllers. Is this a good thing? No one can agree on that. The first Silex app I did, I did not do that. I actually passed in services directly, and that got very clumsy. These days, I go with the rule of, if this becomes a problem, it's because you have way too much logic in your controllers, move it out. So, again, you know, pick your poison on that one. Uh, you can go either way. For our purposes, just to keep things simple, I'm going to pass in the container to the controller, but nowhere else. And then, this is the exact same code we had before. Except, get user is not getting past a user ID. It's getting the full user object that we've loaded from the database. How does that happen? That happens. we had this convert callback. This one, I believe, does have to be uh, an inline callback. Um, but this lets us upcast those parameters. So we have a user placeholder here. So the user, if provided, will get passed to this callable and replaced with whatever it returns. So in this case, we're going to look up that uh, user by name from the repository and return that loaded user. And if that breaks, the repository will already throw an exception for us, and that'll get handled as a 404 elsewhere. Which means our controller now does less work. It doesn't need to load the object. All it's doing is formatting it. This is a good thing. Cool. So, as long as we're here, let's add a put routine for creating uh, or for updating user objects. Again, we're going to uh, create a method for it, add a convert, bind to it, great. Here's our put user method. Again, JSON decode what gets put, uh, update the object, save it. And then HTTP is actually unclear about what you're supposed to do after a put request. What I'm going to do is uh, respond the exact same way I would had it been a get request. So we've saved the object. We're now going to return the same thing you would get if you just hit it again with a get response, a get request. Is that what you have to do? No. That's what I find convenient to do. All right. We've got users. 
great. We've got a system where we can create and, and update users through the system. We could also delete them. That'd be easy to add. So now let's check out messages. Messages we'll put in our own separate uh, module, again, scare quotes module here. So, application, we register its services and its routes. Okay. We've got a message repository, which looks pretty much the same as the user repository. You could simplify this if you want to. I'm not going to bother. We've got the message itself, an author, and a parent because you can respond to messages. It's just some internal implementation details, whatever. Here's our service provider. Looks pretty much the same. Controller provider. Looks very similar. With one distinction, we also have a post. So messages live at slash messages, which is a list of all messages, um, you can slash message ID, or messages, you can reply to them. So if you send a post request to messages slash message ID reply, we call this con uh, controller, no, the reply method. Find that if, so we have a, uh, a route name for it, do the same upcasting here as we're doing for a get. Okay. Create message. Looks pretty much exactly the same as it did on users. You send a post request to uh, slash messages, create a new message, you send back a redirect. Get a message, fine, sure. I mean, nothing different here except, oh, the message um, author going to overwrite with the author's name rather than internal ID. Again, good REST API practice, you don't expose your internal IDs. And reply is going to also create a new message, but it will populate the parent field right here based on <coughs> the message that's passed in. So notice here we've got the message being replied to, the parent message, and uh, the request. So we grab the content of the request and we just grab the ID off of the message for the parent ID of the, uh, the new message we're creating. And then we send a redirect to the newly created message just as we would have uh, for creating a new one from scratch. Questions at this point? We now have a working Twitter app. And it didn't take very long either. Can we go further than this? Absolutely. Errors. Errors happen because, well, we're humans and humans make mistakes, at least some of us do. I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. And certainly my users make mistakes. In uh, Symfony, most HTTP errors are handled via exceptions. The routing system or the access control system or whatever will throw an exception that gets caught by an exception listener and converted into a response. So that's how Symfony works, that's how Silex works, that's how Drupal 8 works. Here's some error listeners. The app error is a shortcut for uh, accessing the exception event in the uh, Symphony kernel. So I, I say those words. Does everyone understand what I mean when I say the exception event of the Symphony kernel? Does anyone not know what that means? I can I can fill that in. Okay, good. On the same page. So each of these is just a callable that will be the, uh, the, list, the body of the listener for that event. <coughs> and you can provide it inline, you can provide a, uh, a priority for it, but what's really cool is you can type hint on the type of exception that gets thrown, which means we can just specify, hey, if we get a not found exception, 
and not found HTTP exception, this is what gets called. So I have an object not found, which is what gets thrown by our um, repositories. This will get called. This listener has a lower priority than those, so it gets called at the end, and it'll catch any exception. What do we do with it? Well, again, Silex doesn't tell you. It just says, hey, as long as you get a response back, I'm cool. So uh, what I'd like to use here is a, a library called API Problem. Uh, API Problem is one of two REST error specifications uh, out right now. Uh, the other is BND error. Personally, I like API Problem better, and so I wrote a library for it. This is just a standard library on uh, packages. If you want to download it, very simple, one class, plus tests, of course, uh, for formatting a error message in <coughs> uh, in a standard JSON form. Because you don't want to return an HTML error if someone sends you a JSON request that's invalid, right? You want to send back something that is vaguely what it expects. So. <coughs> Of these cases, we just use this API problem library to specify, all right, here's the, the error information, the body of the exception is going to be our detail field, and then get back that information as an array, create a new JSON response with that, send a uh, 404 not found in this case. Um, if we do have a code, then we can just use that. Uh, error code, we can just use that. And we're done. That's our error handling. Yeah. That's exactly what it does. Uh, it, it calls it based on priority in Silex, or in, in Symphony, um, higher number wins. It's a priority, not a weight. So uh, what it'll do here is exceptions get thrown. First thing it checks is is it an object not found? Is, is the exception an object not found an exception? Nope. All right, check the next one, which is this one. All right, is the type of it not found HTTP exception? Yes. Okay, call that, we're done. Uh, the, this does register three different listeners. So it is three different listeners in the events dispatcher. Um, and actually what it does is take each of these uh, callbacks and wrap it in another object. And that's what it actually ends up uh, calling each time. That's the actual listener. And uh, it does its thing. And it just forwards on to your code. If, it's a, if you don't type in, it always runs, yes. And if you don't return anything, then I believe that also says, I, I didn't handle it, so I'm done. If you do return something, then the first one to return wins and the rest don't get called. So you don't need to do, you know, event arrow set response like you would in a Symphony Listener. This is just a, a shorthand for that, but that's what's ha exactly what's happening under the hood. Yeah, the, the exception listener and the view listener in Symphony work almost exactly the same. Uh, there are shortcuts like this for uh, the request event in Symphony, uh, called before, for the response event in Symphony, called after, and view doesn't have one, but there's an open issue right now where it hopefully should get in the next release because it's silly for it to not have one. Uh, so I hope it gets in, and hopefully it will work the exact same way as exception um, if I win. There's an open discussion in a GitHub thread right now, but uh, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to get that in with the, uh, the type hinting for view as well, because that's really, really powerful, as we'll see in a moment. In fact, that's an excellent segue. We're sending out a REST API, which means we should be having hypermedia links. Because you didn't know this was a, uh, also a talk on REST, not just on Silex, right? Someone told you? Okay. We should be sending out hypermedia links, which uh, there's about eight different formats for in JSON because JSON is a terrible format. It's really easy to parse, but it actually doesn't work well as a REST format because it doesn't do understand the concept of links. So there's a dozen competing formats for it. Go team! XML does actually have a standard for that, more or less. So what we'll do instead here
So now, we modify get user. Um, we're going to use a uh, library ca uh, called a no carrier hal. It's just a, again, random PHP library off of packages that is the most commonly used in PHP for hal. Hal stands for Hypertext Application Language. It's uh, probably the leading format right now for uh, hypermedia with JSON. It's an IETF draft spec. Uh, it's also what is used by default by Drupal 8 and by default by uh, Zend App Agility. So it's a good format to know. It's very simple. You take any arbitrary JSON object and you stick a magic property on it called links and another one called uh, embed. And those have a defined structure to them. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail other than to say we're going to return not a string, not a response, but a HAL object from our controller. Why? Why a HAL object? Because I'm just returning the data. I'm not responsible for formatting it. Who here knows Paul Jones? Good PHP developer. All right. Uh, Google for something called Action Domain Responder. It's a something he's been pushing recently as uh, an architectural pattern similar to what people incorrectly call MVC. Um, that actually fits the web a lot better where incoming request goes to an action which processes the re that request, but then something else is responsible for formatting a response. Because those are two separate actions. It's not really a MVC type structure uh, necessarily. And this actually fits really, really well with Symfony's HTTP kernel. This is how Drupal 8 is working. This is how you should be doing things in Symfony and Silex. Um, Fabian actually says don't, don't use the view listener because it's slower. It is sometimes, but <coughs> I find the architectural separation that it gives you really, really nice. So our controller here is now going to return this thing that is not a response and not a string. So do we know what to do with that? Instead, we're going to register some listeners to the view event. Syntax here is a bit clunkier. As I said, there is no wrapper for view yet. There will be soon, I hope. Um, so we use the more generic app on, which is on the various events, kernel events view, and we have to do it the, the clunky way. So we actually have a response object, or a um, event object. We get the control results off of it. And this is now exactly the same as in any other Symfony app. If the uh, results that, that came back from the controller is an instance of that HAL object, then we'll handle it. If it's not, we won't, and whoever comes next will take care of it. <coughs> uh, so what do we do with that? If it is, if the request is JSON or HAL JSON, is the, the formats, then we'll wrap that in our own response object that formats it as HAL. We can set it to format the JSON nicely if we're in debug mode so that it's much easier for me to read the JSON rather than it being one long string. Um, if it's not, if the request is not one of those formats, one of those HAL JSON formats, then we'll say, all right, if we're in debug mode, you're probably just typing stuff into your browser, so I'll go ahead and return it anyway, and I'll assume you want JSON back, but I'm gonna send a response type of application JSON, not HAL JSON, uh, because browsers are stupid, and will f if you send back a response of application JSON, they will print it as text. If you send back a JSON variant, they won't know what to do with it, and they'll ask you to save the file. So this just makes debugging easier. But if we're in production, and the request format is not JSON or HAL JSON, then we'll throw an appropriate exception, not acceptable, wrong uh, mime type, and that gets converted to uh, a response by Silex, and you, uh, you get the, um, a nice error message back. Actually, we're handling that ourselves, so no, no acceptable format found. How do we know about that HAL JSON? Well, we also are registering some before listeners. We're doing content negotiation. Please don't do content negotiation this uh, blindly. This is not a great implementation, but it does work. Just get the acceptable content types out of the request. That's, you know, what what uh, content types did that request say um, were acceptable in the uh, accept header. Check the, again, the available formats. 
if it's one of the uh, machine name formats that uh, Silex supports and Symphony supports, specify that. And we're going to default to JSON if we don't know what else to do. Is this the right way to handle it? It's not very robust, but it fits on, a, on uh, one screen, so I'm good with it. So request comes in, we do content negotiation, routing happens, maps off to our controller, controller uh, returns a HAL object, view listener turns that HAL object into a JSON response, and we're good. We've written all of this ourselves, and it's only taken us, what, 45 minutes? One last thing, caching. It's kind of important. Silex does absolutely no caching. On the PHP side, because you probably don't need it, it's lightweight enough that it's not a big deal, and if you get to the point that you need it, well, you can implement it yourself. Or move your app over to Symfony where it does a lot more rebuilding of stuff. But Symfony doesn't do render caching either. Caching of the output is HTTP's job. HTTP already takes care of caching for you. You should let it. You just have to give it the right headers. What are those right headers? Let's register some after listeners. This is the response event. If we're in debug mode, disable all caching. Great. Uh, we've got a cache lifetime um, configuration property we allow. We'll default to zero. And then We'll just set on the response, hey, our cache lifetime is 3,600 seconds, five minutes. So the time to live on the cache for both proxies and for the browser's cache is five minutes. You can vary those separately if you feel like it. I'm going to set them the same, whatever. Uh, set an expires header as well for older clients. And set an e tag. An e tag is simply <coughs> um, some unique hash that indicates if this has changed, that means the output has changed, and so you need to get it again. This is part of the HTTP1 spec. This is not, again, this is not necessarily the most robust way of uh, getting, or of generating a, uh, an e-tag, but it works. And so the challenge is I can't just invalidate the cache when someone updates an object because we've got these links between them, and so those links could vary when the object doesn't. So I'm going to take the cheap way out and run, run through the entire process, and at the end say, all right, now that I know what the response is going to be, does the SHA-1 match the e-tag that the browser sent? Saying, hey, last time I requested this, here's the e-tag I got back. I've still got that version. If it hasn't changed, just let me know. And then we can just ask Symfony, hey, Symfony, or Silex, it's Symfony library, if given that request and the response I'm about to send, nothing's actually changed, then send a not modified, a 304 not modified instead. And Symfony will chop off the uh, body, change the response type to 304 not modified, and send it back. And you are sending back just HTTP headers, no actual body, saving the network. If you've got Varnish sitting between you and the client, great. It'll cache stuff for however long you tell it to. It may even handle some e-tag stuff. This is all offloading cache logic to some HTTP server that knows what it's doing with that. Nginx, Varnish, a CDN, take your pick. They do it better than you do, and they're faster than PHP. Let them. And with that, we have implemented a cached Twitter clone with proper REST semantics in Silex in 56 minutes. Thank you. We've got about four minutes for questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Doing the, the question was doing e tags this way doesn't actually save us time in PHP. That's correct. Um, if you want, you can put this same logic in the uh, in a before listener, aka request listener. Um, if your logic for knowing what the e-tag is supposed to be can be done before you get to the controller. If you know that, great. Move this logic to a before listener, and you can just you know, check there and say, oh, 
response, uh, create a new response, not modified, return that, bypass everything else. Same thing works in Symfony, same thing works in Drupal 8, all exactly the same. In this case, again, because of the cross-linking, it's possible that the response that comes back at one URL, uh, the, the actual bytes may change, even if the underlying object doesn't, because of the links. Like if I, I'm linking to another object and I include its name, that object changes, I change too. So that kind of cache invalidation is hard. I decided I didn't want to bother with that here. If your application can do that, by all means, you know, save yourself the, the CPU. But this at least does save network traffic and uh, browser speed or client speed. Can you use annotation for routing? Um, I haven't. There may be a provider that uh, will do that kind of scan. It would then have to cache it as well somewhere, otherwise it'd be way too slow. Um, I don't know, there's probably a, uh, a mechanism for it, but I haven't used it. I prefer to just go old school here. Which does bring up an interesting point. Um, because Silex doesn't do the compilation by default that Symfony does, that means it does have, you know, it's much more lightweight on an individual request, but it does have a scaling issue. If you have an app that has 400 services and 80 routes, those have to get re-registered on every single request. Uh, I understand there are some dumping tools for Silex. I have not used any of them. Or at that point, you convert your app over to Symfony or Drupal 8 or whatever. Should be easy if you've done your job right, i.e., if your logic is all over in services, you copy those over into a Drupal 8 site, into a Silex framework, whatever, uh, tweak your you know, controller a little bit, tweak your routes a little bit. It could take you an afternoon to port your app from, uh, from Silex to Symfony or to Drupal 8 if you've done it well. Yeah, all the way in the back. I don't think that microphone's on. I can repeat. The question is for someone new to Symphony, is this a good place to start for a small app? Yes, I did. Um, because it has so little stuff built into it, it makes it much easier to look at just the bare bones core pipeline. Uh, Fabian recommends that as well. Um, if you want to learn how Symphony works under the hood, use Silex. Because it's the same kernel that Silex, that Symphony uses, that Drupal 8 uses, that various other things use. but all of the stuff on top of it is stripped away. So it, it is actually a very good uh, Symfony learning tool. Again, it worked for an awful lot of systems. You can download uh, Twig provider. There's a Twig provider for it. You download Twig, you can build pages with Twig instead. Um, for pure API stuff, I really like Silex. I, I actually kind of like not having all of the conceptual layers of overhead that Symfony has. That said, I also work on Drupal 8, so go figure. Point is, yeah, it, it's a perfectly viable option um, if it will do what you want. And one of the advantages of all, all of these systems using the same common component is your same team can jump from Silex to Symfony to Drupal 8 and back uh, with relatively little retraining because all you need to learn is the stuff on top of that common pipeline. That common pipeline is going to be the same on all three. So if you think just to yourself, oh, I would do this in a request listener in Symfony, that that answer is going to be the same in Drupal 8 or in Silex. If you say, "Oh, I'm going to do this weird logic with you know grabbing the response, uh, doing some regex on the string, for whatever reason," you can take that code and move it almost verbatim from Drupal 8 over to Symfony, and you know all three of those systems can interchange to a large degree. Um, so that makes it a lot easier for teams to cross train in all three of them. Okay, I have time for one more question before they throw me out. All right, great timing. Thank you, enjoy the rest of the conference.